goal to, to everything else you're doing with the organization? What, what appealed to you to the job? A uh, really tough decision to leave Seattle, uh, you know, certainly is, uh, you know, what did we decide, Jackson? I've been on your show for five years or something like that. I mean, six that, that was, years uh, now, six, six years. years. Um, you know, definitely family wise, didn't want to leave, wasn't looking to leave. Um, but really what it come down to is that this is a significant promotion and it was a promotion that was not going to be available in Seattle. Um, so to, to go from being a GM there to being a CEO here, uh, running soccer in Seattle, now we're running soccer and business, uh, together in Atlanta, you know, it's, it's a, it's a challenge that I've wanted for a number of years. Uh, from my perspective, I've, I've put in 15 years of work as a GM, um, to, to try to get an opportunity like this. Um, I, and I, I look, I've, I've been offered other CEO jobs in the past at clubs that weren't of the scale or the scope of the Sounders, and I've turned them down. Um, and, and this was, I think, a comparable uh, club and, you know, again, a, a bigger opportunity and, you know, full credit to Adrian. Uh, you know, he he from day one had always said, like, this is how the Sounders are going to be organized, you know, and I'm not going to change that structure for any one person. And um, and again, the organization's had incredible success and, and uh, you know, is in good hands right now with with Craig Weibel. Uh, so who I, you know, certainly personally recommended and I've trained a couple different times. And so, you know, I believe that and I believe that the Sounders structure works. And I believe that as long as Adrian Hanauer is the owner out there, that you don't need to change the structure out there. So, um, you know, nothing but positives uh, about my experience. Really grateful for the eight years I had out there. Um, learned a lot, uh, won a lot hopefully left it in a little bit better shape than I found it. Um, that's usually the standard. Um, and, you know, really grateful likewise for the opportunity here in Atlanta and excited about the new opportunity and the challenge. Hi, Garth. Nice to, nice to see you again. Um, wanted to ask a little bit more about that uh, as far as the, the want to uh, have both positions, the CEO of, of soccer and business side. Were there any uh, clashes uh, in Seattle, though, because you you did want that um, kind of dual role. And when was it that you definitely felt that maybe, you know, your head was hitting the ceiling in a sense of, of wanting to move on? Um, no clashes, Jada. You know, Peter Thomas and I got along well. We're, you know, friends this day. And before him, Bart Wiley and I had a good relationship. So, uh, not you know, nothing there at all. Um, you know, it was, it was more, you know, uh, just, you know, Again, you guys know I talk about my family a lot. So just going back to my to my dad, I said, "What was the most important thing in your career?" And he said, "Well, you got to always keep learning. And if you always if you continue to learn, you'll continue to grow, you'll continue to evolve, and you'll continue to get new challenges, and that'll make life interesting and fulfilling." And and you know, I think there was an element of, uh, you know, I'd done the same job for fifteen years, and uh, you know, I wouldn't say that it was bumping up against the ceiling, Jada, in the sense of again, I I knew what the structure was, I wasn't confused about that, um, but at some point, I kind of wanted to learn some new stuff, and and that's not a criticism of anything or anyone, you know. I, I think in a lot of ways, it would have been easier for me to stay in Seattle. Um, you know, I think Seattle's going to have a very good team, obviously, like Atlanta's team as well, but. Um, you know, things were set up pretty well contractually for at least another year in Seattle. Um, and again, we have, you know, all the staff that I hired <laughs> on the business side I'm intimately familiar with and uh, we're all experienced together. And, um, you know, so I think in a lot of ways, this was this was hard. This was a harder thing to do. And um, but I felt like this was my best opportunity to keep learning. And so that's why I made the decision. And and look, the the other side of it that's personal always is uh, uh, my wife has family in Tennessee. And, and that was definitely a, a component to it as well, uh, that uh, we're moving a little bit closer to families so we're a couple hours away now. And, um, you know, so that that whole thing kind of came together because, you know, I, I've talked for years about how happy our family was in Seattle. And it was it was awesome. I mean, it, it really was. And, and uh, you know, really grateful for that time. And uh, we couldn't possibly have enjoyed it more. And we had the best neighbors and uh, the fan base was so supportive and appreciative, just really, really grateful for everything that we had in, in Seattle and, and now looking again, looking to, looking forward, taking a risk and looking forward to that next challenge uh, with another significant fan base in, in Atlanta. Hey, Garth, Nico here. Uh, great to see you again. Uh, I wanted to know how quickly did this come about? Because, I mean, uh, you know, there was a GM vote, there was an annual meeting that you were at and everything that I've heard just reads that this happened immediately quickly it just happened too too fast and after that business meeting is that correctly 
Yeah, let me give you the timeline because this is a good question, Nico. And I think there's been some confusion about it. It was both fast and slow out here. So, uh, you know, obviously Darren left uh, Atlanta in the summer. Um, and I think it was difficult to impossible for them to really begin a search. Uh, certainly a search of the MLS candidates wasn't possible till after the season because the Sounders were trying to make the playoffs. Atlanta was trying to make the playoffs. So, um, but they initiated contact, Atlanta initiated contact after the season. Um, there was a multi-step, multi-part uh, uh, interview process um, that went on over a number of weeks, you know, longer, longer than a month. So that's that was the the slow part. And I don't mean that they moved slowly, just that you know it, it took some time. And um, again, it's super important to get the diversity requirements right in that process and give everyone a fair shake. And um, so that was very strictly adhered to um, as part of that. Uh, and and then it was fast in the sense that it came up right after the the fan vote was announced. So, but to give that to give again to try to go into detail there. Um, I had done what turned out to be the last interview of my process. And again, I don't know what they were doing with other candidates, but uh, with for my last one, I had given it uh, over a week before the announcement of the retention vote. So on that on that Wednesday, I think, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever I walked on stage and said, hey, thanks and 90% approval, I really appreciate it. You know, not only did I not have any job offer, but it had been over a week since my last interview. So I was of the mindset that like, hey, you know, this may well not happen. Um, you know, this, this this is, um, you know, a significant event, you know, that that amount of time has gone by, you know, hey, not sure if they liked me or didn't like me or whatever. But again, I don't think it actually, it, it, it amounted to anything. They were just going through the process, but I, I just had no way of knowing that. And um, so I went up and I spoke sincerely and I spoke, you know, from the heart that, that I, of, you know, again, about how grateful I was about the for the opportunity and, and the eight years. And at that point was assuming I was continuing. Um, and uh, literally within 48 hours of that event, then uh, I got a job offer from Atlanta and um, that's then something that we entered negotiations and, and ultimately uh, wound up heading out here. But um, that's the timeline. So does that, does that make sense? I know it's probably a little confusing and I'm sure, it felt disjointed. It probably felt very fast from me being on stage saying thank you to, you know, I think a week later uh, being announced as the Atlanta United CEO. So I just, it's really important to me actually that, that people understand that there was no lack of sincerity on my end at all, nor was there any on, on the part of Atlanta United. Everyone was going through their process and doing their thing. And that's just the way the timing worked out. Garth, with that, was there, um, you know, with the the offer being in a in a forty eight hour uh, kind of period, uh, what what did you what did you initially then feel uh, as far as, you know, making that um, that statement or that uh, speech to to everybody at at the uh, Long Acres, and then you know knowing that you were going to you know kind of do the reverse in the, in the sense of, of leaving was there much emotional you know tire or you know as far as you working through it even within yourself you know like geez yeah look I, I mean I, I mean I was there for eight years and we won a lot of stuff um you know there's a lot of ties to to the fan base to to all of you uh all of you who have been you know very fair uh you know journalists with respect to the sounders and and uh you know, Jada, you know, you and I spoke and I, you know, I think you tried to pin me down. Like, you know, are you committing? Is this, you know, wow. are you in now? Right. And, and I did my best again to answer truthfully and respectfully that, you know, I, I, I didn't commit to stay in because I, I didn't know what was going to happen. And, um, you know, but likewise expressed sincerely that it was a great place. And it did sound the Saunders is a great place. It's an amazing place. Um, and, and that's why I spent eight years there. Uh, um, so, um, was it hard yet? Yeah, I mean, Jada, just to get to the question. Yeah, it was really hard. It was super hard. Um, it, it, it was, and it was never going to be easy. I mean, you can't invest eight years of your life and your family's life. And, you know, one of our sons was born in Seattle and they all like, that's the only place that my family remembers. I mean, they were, my boys were three and baby, literally six months when we left Salt Lake. Uh, and as I said, we our, the third one wasn't around yet. So, you know, all of my kids, that's all they know is Seattle. So it was it was a huge deal uh, to to contemplate moving, and and I think it would have it it did take a you know an almost perfect scenario, literally closer to my wife's family, a clear promotion for me from a career perspective, and a club that is you know uh, on equal terms with the Sounders. You know that those are some pretty big boxes to check, 
Um, and when they, you know, when they, when they did, then, then it was something that ultimately I decided to do. Hey, Garth, it's Jeremiah. Um, if moving the uh, forward a little bit, what, what would you say the, what kind of advice would you give to Craig and the Sounders? And, and what do you think some of the, the challenges that, uh, that he faces coming up here are? Um, Look, I, again, I want to repeat, you guys are in good hands with with Craig Weibel. Uh, he's a good man. Uh, he's a good GM. Uh, he's earned it. He's been a GM before. He's experienced. There's not going to be any situation that comes up that uh, that he hasn't seen before. So, um, you know, rest assured, uh, he, he, you're under really, really good leadership. Um, you know, and, and if you don't believe me, uh, look at the the track record in Salt Lake. Uh, you know, after I left, uh, Craig really doubled down on the academy and established that as a as a long term uh, source of strength for that club. And, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, Craig and I would both say that it's a source of pride for us that Salt Lake has not fallen apart since we left, you know, that the structures we put in place um, and certainly Craig more than me, certainly at this point, because I'm I'm fully, you know, almost a decade removed at this point, but, um, you know, did a lot of good work there in terms of establishing foundations and using limited resources. And um, again, I think that's something that whenever you take someone from a small club to a bigger club, you're going to get a pretty good skill set in the sense of they're used to doing more with less and now you have more. So doing more with more is easier than doing more with less. So, um, you know, in terms of specific challenges, look, I mean, there's there's always going to be contracts and players and, you know, long-term planning and stuff. And I have no doubt that Craig will see things a little differently than I did. And, you know, he'll, he'll, you know, put his vision into place and he'll get things rolling and, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll let him take, I'll let him take it from there. And and you can ask him, Jeremiah, about what he thinks are his, uh, his challenges, but he's, he's well qualified for the job. I can assure you that. And, and in Adrian Hanauer, you know, you got the only owner in the league that's, that's been a general manager as well. And he's going to have a lot of help and support on that front as well. Do you think that the um, Sounders would have benefited at all then to having a longer process or bringing anybody else in? Or is there any critique to be had um, aside from, you know, the diversity search? Um, you know, was there is there any critique to be had to to making that simple move? I don't want to say simple, I, you know, that that move to to upgrade credit. Yeah, look, and I think on some level, that's just a question for Adrian, right? I mean, I, I'm not walking in his shoes, so I don't know what the alternatives were. Um, and, and look, Jade, if we're honest, it, it depends what you think of me, right? If 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 you think I was kind of just above average, then uh, replace me isn't that hard, right? You slot libel in and it's no big deal. And, uh, you know, if, if you think I had some uh, secret formula or special sauce, then maybe, it, uh, you know, you want to dig in. But but even if you do believe that I'm I was pretty good, Weibel spent more time with me than anybody else out there. So, you know, I think there's a case uh, to support the, the, the course that the, that the Sounders took, you know, that, that uh, if you think I was pretty good, Weibel knows me better than anybody else out there. Probably. I mean, Chris Henderson would obviously have a, a claim to that as well, but Chris is under contract uh, to another club. So uh, that wasn't an option. And, um, you know, certainly Jada, as we've talked about over the years, the diversity stuff is very important. And I have no doubt the Sounders are going to run a ro robust process uh, with respect to that. That was always one of their core values. I'm sure it will continue to be. Um, and, and you know, for that, I think best to best to ask them in terms of the details of how they how they went about went about that process. Hey, Garth, when you, came to Seattle, uh, when you came to Seattle, one of the big pillars that you talked about was getting to and winning Champions League because of what happened at RSL. Um, as you begin this new chapter at Atlanta, what is the new mountaintop or is there a new mountaintop for you, uh, you know, as you begin this new job? Well, it's just win Club World Cup, right, Jackson? I mean, it's logical. No, I mean, <laughs> is that the next one? Yeah, look, remember when I started at Seattle, I was the knucklehead who said, oh, I definitely going to do better than the 2014 team that won the Open Cup and the Supporter Shield, right? I mean, it, it still seems like a poor choice, even for me. Um, and, you know, so when I came in and I did that interview, right, which was in the first two weeks on the job, to some degree, I didn't have a lot of choice, right? <laughs> like, if I'm going to puff my chest out and say I'm going to be better than what came before, well, what's left? Well, MLS Cup and Champions League, right? So, uh, you know, I think in Atlanta, you know, they had this meteoric rise, 17, 18, 19 gangbusters, multiple trophies, 
and then you've had kind of this inevitable lull, right? And and I think part of what I'm coming into Atlanta to do is to to provide a little bit more st- sustainability, um, to provide a foundation and and provide sustainable growth. And so I think here winning Champions League is is less an immediate goal, right? Than hey, let's get this thing right size, let's get this thing headed the right direction, let's get back to winning, hosting and winning playoff games. And once you build that foundation, now we can move on to those other things. You know, whereas, you know, that 2014 group, and again, even with hindsight, right? Like, uh, you know, they, they win stuff, 15 wasn't great, um, but then we added a couple folks in 16 and won the title, right? So the 14 group wasn't that far off. I don't know that uh, in Atlanta, and not not suggesting Atlanta is that far off either. But again, in in my sixth day on the job, I can't claim that I I have that uh, that same feel of the inevitability of that success. I think we got to tweak some things and and reset some things, and and uh, you know just in general, um, you know I'm going to come in and lend 15 years of experience and try to make uh, folks around me better, and and hope that uh, we get better outcomes. I mean, it sounds like CCL could trump all those objectives, though, uh, Garth. So I think you did all right. Uh, in Thank terms you. of, you know, uh, you, you don't get to be Garth without being ambitious, but how um, uh, uh, intimidating is the fact that you're going to be going into a organization where now the expectations can be high because they're used to spending a lot more money for players they they're 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 a little bit different than the two clubs that you've been with in the past in seattle and rsl yeah uh, look i mean spending money doesn't make you smarter though right nico so uh there there are a ton of resources here and for sure there's a ton of expectations a ton of pressure but so was there in seattle right i I don't not aware of our fans in seattle ever saying hey it's okay if you don't make the playoffs Uh, you know uh, to the contrary even in the year where the Sounders won the Champions League, you know, a lot of people are pretty upset uh, that that uh, they missed the playoffs for the first time in, in 14 years. So, look, I think you're going to have similar ambition. I think you're going to have similar uh, expectation. Um, you know, yes, we have some resources here, but we have to allocate them wisely. Um, and again, I, I don't want to act like Seattle didn't have resources, right? Every time I that I, I asked for money for DPs, for Ladero, for Rui Diaz, for Joe Paulo, um, you know, they were provided, you know, the fan and, and that it's the same dynamic in Atlanta, right? It's the same virtuous cycle. You have a rabid fan base that's really big, that's willing to spend money on the team. And you have an owner that's willing to take the money from the fans and reinvest it in the team. So it's it's the same formula. Um, and there, there's going to be you know different nuance to it in both places. But, you know, I think fundamentally it's, it's a matter of uh, spending smartly, um, not just, you know, uh, on a greater scale, you know, that, that in and of itself, I think doesn't yield uh, championships. And what's the balancing act between, you know, Seattle was a place where you would perhaps were more likely to bring in a DP to be here for a very long time and help you win championships, uh, whether maybe sometimes it might feel like Atlanta also wants to be part of the buy and sell type of club approach you, you, you kind of get what i'm saying is that any yeah. different how do you how do you go about that i don't i don't know that it's black and white nico i mean like we have tiago amato here might be the best player signed in the history of mls like i'm certainly supportive of that right i mean it would be utterly <laughs> foolish to not want the guy who plays for argentina in the world cup on your team and as the basis of your team you know, uh, if if you have different players over time in different positions, like could you evolve? Sure. You know, can, I mean, look, I mean, literally why I'm here, right, is to take elements of what worked at Atlanta, take elements of work, what worked at Salt Lake, elements of what worked in Seattle. And that's my experience. Right. And I think then you apply it to the situation, uh, both as it is now and as it evolves. And and when you look at that, then I do think, you know, the, there may be times where we want to sign an older player here. But I think that, that might be position specific. And it might be contract specific in terms of what is our progression and where are we in our cycle, right? You guys know that I've meticulously built built out the cycle in Seattle, um, and you want to make sure that you're hitting your, you know, you want to add your foundational pieces. And again, you have some foundational pieces in Atlanta, so I, I think they're kind of in the middle right now, and we just got to get it headed back up to the top, <coughs> and then figure out where we want to add, and then uh, decide if if we need to make any kind of different type of investments at this point, at that point when we. Once we get through that period, how beneficial was it to have uh, Gonzo there, uh, a guy that you've worked with, obviously here? 
Yeah, Gonzo and I, we, we've uh, met, we met, well, we met once, Jackson, because again, I'm on day six. Um, but uh, it was really fun. It was really good to see him. Uh, I gave him a big hug first time I saw him. And, uh, you know, he's a good young coach and I'm excited to work with him. And, you know, the thing is, too, that it's just, it is, it's the same, but different, you know, I, of all the things, Jackson, I mean, um, Manny's here, who you would, at one point was the team administrator for Defiance. Uh, Scotty's here, who was the uh, assistant equipment manager under Nolan. Uh, so there's a couple of friendly Seattle faces in that regard. Um, and Gonzo obviously is a friendly Sounders face, but the roles are totally different, right? I mean, whereas, uh, you know, in Seattle, it was GM to assistant coach. Now, now Gonzo's the head guy. And every, every assistant coach I've ever met, when they become a head coach, they 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 have to prioritize differently. It's a bigger picture job. It's it's It becomes, I think, less ideological and more pragmatic because you have to put the, the you know you need ideas as an assistant as the head coach you got to put them into practice and you got to win games so um you know i sense that gonzo has got a super positive attitude uh, again it was a really friendly meeting and for me again i'm not the gm i'm the ceo so my job is to put carlos and gonzo together now uh and to make them both successful collectively um but not be in there in terms of going to training and being there in the day-to-day -day. so it's just a fundamentally different relationship but certainly having that familiarity um, is a good thing. And, and uh, you know, look, if I'm going to promise anything my first year, I've, I'm four for four. I've, I've had four head coaches, gotten the playoffs with all of them. Hopefully this year it's five for five. Beth, can you go into a little bit more about the uh, first week? Like what, what is, uh, what, what has been, what have the five, six days been like? Uh, it's been a lot, Jada. Um, as you can imagine, you know, starting a new job, moving across the country, uh, you know, uh, trying to learn the business, you know, because it's Atlanta United sits under the Arthur Blank Sports and Entertainment Empire. And so not only am I learning the Atlanta United business, but I have to understand how it functions within that whole structure. So I've um, been meeting a, a ton of people, as you would expect, uh, trying to remember a name here or there along the way, um, you know, met the media core. Uh, last week for the first time. So, uh, you know, just just honestly, a lot of saying hello and, and getting to know people and um, we're digging into budgets and things like that now. So and, and gotten over the team. So, you know, just kind of I, I just tell everybody right now that it is not possible for any one person to process all of this information right now. I'm just putting, you know, going one day at a time here, learning everything I can and uh, trying to do it in a positive way. And I'm really glad I got out here as quickly as I did, because I think a lot of this kind of assimilation stuff can now happen before the holiday. And then hopefully that kind of clears the deck where you've kind of gotten through the very, that very initial phase of at least saying, hey, how you doing and, and what do you do for us? Um, and then into the actual, you know, strategic planning and, and looking at strengths and weaknesses and how we want to build the organization uh, by early 2023. Can you go a little bit into the power dynamic? I mean, GM is kind of like what you were just, just dominant at. And, you know, how, how do you work that with uh, Carlos? Do you just wait for him to ask for help? Do you, I mean, how, you know, how do you kind of go about just maybe restraining yourself and not try to, you know, rock the ship when it comes to him being the GM and, and you trying to guide him the right way. Yeah, look, it, it, it look, my parents are both teachers, Nico. So so I, I have some mentoring ability in me and um, I think it's really fun. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm here as a resource to Carlos. Anytime he has a question, fire away. I'm going to do my best, you know, as you said, not to get in his way. I'm certainly not going to dictate things to him. Um, certainly though, you know, we both have our experiences, right. And, and if we put our, our experiences together, hopefully we can, we can mesh and, and, uh, get it to a better place overall, but there's a ton of good things here. Uh, you know, again, there's, there's some process things that I think we're in, you know, we are in the process of adding, you know, that, that, uh, that I will insist upon, but it's not, again, it's not because we don't have good inputs. I think, I think we have good inputs. I think we have good talent. I think we have good people, uh, and we have good resources. It, it's, I view the job right now as coming in unifying those things and getting everybody pulling in the right direction. Uh, are those resources different or, uh, you know, I don't know what are the pros or cons of, uh, the fact that, you know, the Falcons ownership and, and Atlanta United is kind of all together. Does that help you in any way? Is that any different? Um, look, there are probably some efficiencies on the business side, you know, just in the sense of having, you know, the, the AMBSE owns the stadium, the Falcons, 
uh, Atlanta United and they own some other stuff as well. Um, but you have, you know, you do have a staff that can run kind of the whole operation collectively. Uh, but to be honest, in terms of the day-to-day of Atlanta United as compared to the Sounders, I don't know that there's that much difference. I mean, you still need to fill the same functions and roles. You still need to sell tickets to fans, um, you know, sell corporate partnerships. And again, like the details of that, you know, how the revenue is allocated and stuff that, that, you know, that might be slightly different, but in terms of the day-to-day and how you organize things, it's pretty similar. I know you've only been there a week uh, or so, but is anything caught you by surprise or either good or bad in terms of either the things you learned about the sporting side or things you learned about the business side, just anything that you weren't necessarily expecting uh, that's come up in the last week? Look, I was aware that there were things I didn't know, Jeremiah. So like, you know, things that have shocked me, no, but obviously I'm learning the business, right? And and the business here is is different than the business in Seattle. And, you know, Seattle is, you know, always been run by Adrian Hanno, by, by one person to, you know, set the scope and the vision of the company. And AMBSC is a much broader organization. You know, it, it is much more corporate. And so there are different policies and procedures and different ways that decisions get made. And, um, you know, again, there are pros and cons. It's not, it's not good or bad. Um, but it's definitely uh, a, a different feel in Atlanta uh, than it is in Seattle. And, um, you know, it's it's something where that's part of the process. The You know, I, one other example, you know, the Sounders have been remote for a uh, better part of two years now. Um, and I, I asked when I in, in the interview, I asked uh, the Atlanta folks about that. And, you know, they, they stopped me short and said, hey, we work from work uh, here at uh, AMBSE. So um, it's it's uh, much more in-person focused. And, and that's cool. You know, it, that's up to me to to adjust. And again, I knew what I was getting into. And um, so it's just, you know, different cultures and different parts of the country and different corp- different corporate aspects to it. So it's just uh, finding your way through those things and, and uh, making the best of them. We got time for a couple more if anyone has any. Yeah, I've got a couple. Uh, well, one quick one is um, so what's the staff size then? Um, you know, to kind of put it in numbers, uh, you know, how, how many people are you uh, overseeing now and versus Seattle? Yeah, so the answer is the organizations are pretty comparable again, Jada. So so the total number of people is is very similar. It's just in Seattle, there were 40 ish people, I think, on the soccer side. Uh, and I think. I think the number in my head is 150, 160, maybe overall. Um, and so now I'm I'm over the 150, 160 as opposed to the 40. But it, but there's to be clear, there's not really that much difference. I don't in, as far as I can tell between Seattle and Atlanta in terms of soccer side versus business side. And then if, if nobody else does, I have a uh, one question. You um, had mentioned the way that you and your wife had met, and I was just curious about that that story and. Um, if there's anything like president wise, like now that, you know, as far as being in that corporate environment, if there's anything that would have been sketchy now versus then, I'm guessing this is the nineties. Right? And sorry, Jen, I'm not, not sure I'm following all together. Oh, other than I wanted to know the story. Sorry. I just want, I was told oh, the story about how my wife and I met. Yeah. Cause you had mentioned sleeping in the office and, and all oh, of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, look, it's like it's very kind of you to to in, engage and humor me like that. Uh, and I'll I'll just say that uh, Hillary made her first appearance in Atlanta uh, of her life uh, this weekend. And uh, we had to look for schools, look for houses and celebrate our anniversary, our, our uh, uh, 12th anniversary together, uh, all in a very limited t- period of time. So but it's been a lot of fun. Um, that story is just that uh, I worked at the law firm at, at Latham and Watkins in D.C., um, and the woman who worked next to me uh, was Hillary's stepmother, and she, you know, she asked if uh, I would like to meet her daughter and, and her stepdaughter, and I, of course, said, you know, yes, politely, and you know, in a work function, it, it, you can imagine it was a little, it was a little, a little awkward, but uh, I said, you know, sure, absolutely, and um, Hillary and I uh, were both equally skeptical of this meeting, so uh, we both brought friends with us uh, to the bar where we were supposed to meet, you know, figuring we'd kind of uh, fist bump and, and, and walk away. And so we checked the box and, uh, Hillary's friends, uh, uh were a little exuberant. They were, they were overserved in, in their, uh, telling of it. And then, uh, the bar, uh, personnel asked them to leave. Uh, so they got removed and, uh, Hillary got stuck talking to me for a couple hours and, and, uh, the rest is history. So, uh, you know, basically Jade, I got an opportunity. I couldn't screw up thanks to somebody drinking too much. So, uh, I, I, uh, I did the best I could.
Okay, <laughs> that's a good story because the the way that you had said it originally, given some of the uh, indiscretions going on with some people corporate wise, you had said something about sleeping in the office, and then you know you met your wife, and so that that was like that sounded weird. So I'm glad that I got. I, I, well, it probably sounded weird. What, to the extent sleeping in the office, what I meant by that was literally sleeping on the floor underneath my desk because we were doing hundred hour weeks back to back to back, trying to do corporate deals, trying to get things done. So. So uh, not nothing, nothing there other than uncomfortable uh, concrete with a thin carpet over it. Thank you. Hey, Garth, I'll do I'll do one last, I'll probably a, a tough one here at the end for you. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously, Carlos de Bocanegra has been there for a long time. He's uh, someone that's at times been criticized uh, by, by fans and things. How do you approach? Uh, that first interaction or maybe that uh, interview in which you try to figure out what's going on and, and how things can improve, particularly to his job, his role, and, and everything he's done for Atlanta United. Yeah, look, Carlos and I, uh, we've been on the CSO committee together, and he was on the Athletes Council for U.S. Soccer for a long time and interacted with them a little bit on some of those issues. So we know each other, but we don't know each other well. You know, I'd say we know each other professionally, but he's a really nice guy and easy to get to know. And, and uh, you know, I, I've enjoyed working with him so far, you know, as to, you know, how we land ultimately as to, uh, you know, how we divide and conquer all the responsibilities. Um, you know, it'll be his show. Um, he'll, you know, he'll be the GM going forward. I will support him. Um, I will certainly, if I have any knowledge to share, I will do my best to do that. And, um, you know, what I would say is, it's been easy so far, Nico. Um, it, 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 uh, Carlos has made it easy. Um, he's not been dogmatic. He's not been ideological. He's not, you know, said, hey, we have to do it this way. This is the only way. And and I think ne neither have I, you know. I think there's always different ways to to, to make things work. And every organization is different. And, and it's a matter of uh, using resources efficiently. And if you do that, then, again, uh, you're going to get more good players over time and you're going to have stability. And I think those are the, the keys to Atlanta United's success going forward. Thank you, Garth. Wish the best of luck. All right. I think we're